Last guy up to the stage. There's a very good reason why I wanted to close this night. On Kumquatsa! I have no fucking idea what this guy's gonna do, but here we go! All right, before I get started, I know all of you, in your mind, you probably think of this as the most glamorous activity in the world. Pro probably, probably. Like, you know, uh, securing this with duct tape. <laughs> the organization and uh, logistics, the extremely professional organization of uh, Lemon and Booth Reindeer, uh, LLC, I assume, uh, have provided these festivities to us tonight. And um, in thanks, uh, I now apparently have made a tradition of getting them stupid shit. Um, I was too lazy to get real stupid shit, so I went to Target about four hours ago to find stupid shit for them. So, Lemon gets a set of uh, spy gear night vision goggles. <laughs> and Mr. Boots rain gear, which I assume he's going to start using immediately, gets a Thomas Kincaid, the painter of light gone with the wind puzzle. <laughs> In any case, please give, please give these two a huge round of applause for this. Thank you. I'm disappointed you're not wearing those with your hamburger crocs. Jam. After several months of hunting down and eliminating Horcruxes, <laughs> Harry Potter, Ron Weasley, and Hermione Granger got a private room at the Leaky Cowdron to discuss strategy. Our raid on the Riddle House has yielded a gold mine of information, gushed Hermione. She still kept her head shaved in an effort to keep Ron from temptation. Now that Najini is dead, the only Horcruxes left are Voldemort himself, and one other. Have you had any luck finding it, asked Harry? That's what I've been trying to tell you, explained Hermione. In his papers, I've not only discovered that he traveled into the future in order to hide it, I've also discovered two spell by which he accomplished time travel. <laughs> time travel, exclaimed Ron. Bloody hell, that artillery bay rage was bad enough. What kind of horrors will the muggles come up with in the future? Artillery bay rage, corrected Hermione. <laughs> and we, we couldn't have gotten into the riddle house without it. The point is, can we duplicate this spell? Asked Harry. <laughs> yes, I believe so, said Hermione. Voldemort's journey through time has created a disruption in, in time that should make it easier for us to follow him in time. <laughs> well, let's start out from Godric's Hollow, replied Harry. The Riddler's energies should be strong in the place where he fell once before. 
They found the spell that would take them into the future quite distasteful, especially the part where they had to kill a goat. Commander Jeffrey Sinclair reached out his hand to the mysterious blue spacesuit clad figure before him. Just as their hands touched, there was a flash and Sinclair was thrown across the room and three robed figures a pureed out of thin air. A strange being ran up to the spacesuit clad figure and handed him something. Zethros fixed, said the being, who then tried to escape the human security guards who had been chasing him. Who are you? demanded Major Crans of the three robed figures. What? I'm Harry Potter, and these are my friends Rope and Weasley and Hermione Granger. <laughs> Two more people stepped for Eward Commander Sinclair and his security chief, Michael Garibaldi. What? Are you from the future? asked Sinclair. No, actually, we're from the past explained Hermione. When and where are we? You're on a space station called Babylon 4, and for me it is the year 2258. <laughs> Michael, take these three and put them on a shuttle. We'll interrogate them further when we get back to Babylon 5. Right, Jeff, we need to get that Exactuation underway too. And so before the three had time to even catch their breath, they found th th themselves on a shuttle bound for Babylon 5. <laughs> Scene change. Harry was sitting a the bar, trying out some breverie, when suddenly he spun around in his bar stool. He had already drawn his wand and was pointing it at the large, narn female, who had turned him to face her. She had orange skin with brown patches and red eyes. You are a human male, correct? inquired Natoth. Why, Dash, yes, said Harry. You will come back to my quarters and mate with me, agreed? <laughs> uh, um, okay, replied Harry, wondering what hot alien sex would be like. When they got to her quarters, Natop said, I am unfamiliar with human mating customs. How do we begin? Well, usually I like to start with some kissing, said Harry. <laughs> Harry took her head in both hands and pulled he in for a kiss. She responded eagerly and slipped her forked tongue into his mouth. After a few minutes of this, Harry slid his hand down to cup a breast. But it didn't feel soft like human breast. It was hard and firm. It felt more like muscle than breast. But if nay the, the hums of pleasure were any indication, she was enjoying Harry's touch there. She put his own hand on Harry's chest and tried to imitate his movements. His hums of his hums of pleasure told her that she was doing it right. Nay, now I'm up here. Now you're down here. Nay Toth broke off their kiss and asked, Is it time to remove our clothing yet? Please. If you like, replied Harry. Nay, Toth, in a very businesslike fashion, removed her clothing. Harry followed suit. Now what, axed Natoth? <laughs> <laughs> More kissing and caressing, suggested Harry. She nodded her assent, like, like going up a mountain. Harry pulled her close and began kissing her again. They sat down on, on the bead, and she gradually leaned back as he began kissing her way down her body. Her gasps and moans told Harry that she was enjoying his attention immensely. After kissing his way down her neck and chest, he tried to take he nipple, only to find that she didn't have any. So he continued to kiss his way down her body, much to her delight. When he got down to the level where her navel should be, he instead found a flap of skin forming a horizontal slit across her belly. What is this? Harry asked. 
It's my pouch, replied Natoth. Harry pulled open the pouch and saw that the inside was bright red colored and was covered with little knobs that looked a little like nipples. Harry began suckling at first one knob, then another. Natoth's reaction told him that he was doing it right. After she had moaned noises... <laughs> How do you do that right? <laughs> uh, Harry kissed his war down to her genitals. <laughs> they... They looked remarkably like a shaved human pussy, except that her clitoris was about six inches long and stood prominently erect. Harry lightly ran his tongue all over her genitals before taking her clit in his mouth and giving it a blowjob while his fingers work inside her. Natoth had a sweet, fruity taste that was different from a human. She made sounds that made Harry think she had come several more times before she picked Harry up and pulled him on top of her. Mate with me, human. Matt with me now. As Harry slid into her, he thought she felt remarkably human for an alien. <laughs> Scene change. <laughs> <laughs> Hermione and Veer and Veer stumbled into his quarters. After delivering the messages, she had gone to rest rant. It had been full, so she had decided to eat at the bar. She was seated next to a centauri male that appeared distraught about something. She struck up a conversation with him and found him to be rather charming and devaluel. They enjoyed their conversation so much that, without meaning to the suddenly, found themselves quite inebriated. In their shrunken stupor, they found themselves wandering into his quarters. Oh, oh my. <laughs> Hermione pulled her closer so that she could plant a sloppy kiss on his lips. He responded back eagerly as they lost their balance and fell onto the bed. Veer held her chin as they kissed Aran, his hand through her hair. Once before he reconsidered, he didn't really like hair on female heads and placed his hand on her breast. Yes. Sober, he never would have had the courage to do such a thing. But the brevery had lowered his inhibitions as it had hers. He's drunk as on he, brevery? Yeah. As he kissed her and caressed her through her clothing, her moans her, her made him so excited that one of his penis wriggled out of his clothing. The other one did a little song and dance. <laughs> when Hermione felt the snake-like appendage rubbing against her tummy, she jumped back in fright. <laughs> what is that? Screamed Hermione. It's a penis, said Beer. <laughs> we males have them. <laughs> I've never seen one like that before, said Hermione. It must be three feet long, and it's prehensile. Just the sight of that enormous wriggling cock filled her with lust. Wh why? Why did it do that? She wanted to touch it. Sure, of course. Yeah. No, no, no. Question withdrawn. Uh, to feel it inside her. Oh! Yeah. She licked 
both her hands and slid one. Then the other over the head of his dick. Then with her hands caressing the shaft, she took the head in her mouth and sucked him off. This was such a unique experience that she was closed her eyes so that she could concentrate on the sensations she was feeling. Veer was ooing and eyeing until suddenly a hot liquid spurted into her mouth. It was hot in more ways than one. It reminded her of Tabasco sauce. She opened her eyes to look for something to drink, just as she felt something brush against her crotch. Veer had unbuttoned his shirt, revealing all six of his penises in all their glory. They were all doing the Harlem Shake. Hermione gasped and jumped back away from him. Too weird for me, said Hermione. She stumbled out the door. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's too weird for me, too. (laughs) Ew. <laughs> <laughs>